All right, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Gene Pang, and I'll be talking about uh, the best practices for using Alexio with Spark. So here's a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Gene Pang. I'm a software engineer at Alexio, and I'm also one of the PMC uh, members of the Alexio Open Source Project. Before I joined Alexio, I, was, I actually got my PhD at, uh, at UC Berkeley from the AMP Lab. And also, before that, I was working on distributed databases uh, at Google. And here you can find my Twitter and GitHub handles. So here is a brief, uh, brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll first give a, a brief overview of what Alexio is and, and the introduction to it. I'll also talk about uh, the Spark use cases out there in the wild, that how companies are using Alexio. I'll then talk about a little bit about uh, the, over, the, over, the high level uh, architecture of Alexio and then, then go into some details of how to use Spark with Alexio, how to deploy it, how to read and write from it, and then, um, then talk about some exper experiments that we have done with Alexio to show some of the benefits of Alexio. So in order to introduce Alexio, let's sort of go, go back in time and look at what the ecosystem looked like uh, back in the day. And so you know, 10, 15 years ago, it, it actually looked pretty simple. The ecosystem was very simple. There was basically Hadoop. Um, it, you know, there was one compute engine, one uh, storage system, and it was actually a very simple way of processing data. But uh, today, you know, the ecosystem has grown considerably uh, since then. And you know, for better or for worse, there's a lot of different options and different uh, uh, systems that we can use. Uh, so here at the bottom, we have you know, you know, many different storage systems. We have, you know, obviously HDFS is still here, but also we have new types of systems such as like cloud storage, like S3 and Amazon Cloud. Um, and we also have you know, a lot of uh, the existing um, storage appliances as well. And we also have a lot of different uh, computation frameworks uh, uh, at the top, we, you know, we have, HD, uh, we have MapReduce, but we also have Spark, which is a big one, and then a lot of other different types of computation engines like uh, Flink and Presto and so on. So there's a lot of different uh, types of systems that you can, you can play around with. And you know, this sort of makes it difficult to manage all these systems, how to add and remove different types of uh, storage and or compute. So um, it, it can actually be, be quite a headache uh, if you really wanted to sort of connect all these together, it, it would just be a, a, a massive headache. Um, and also, uh, another, another point to this is that now that sort of the compute and storage have been uh, you know, separated, because you can sort of mix and match now, uh, the performance can sometimes suffer. Uh, um, since uh, the, the computation framework would have to access remote data from, from, a, from some other storage system. So, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, performance penalties. There's also complexity that's in, in this ecosystem. So with Alexio, Alexio aims to solve those issues. Uh, Alexio is actually a new layer in between the ex, ex, uh, in between the computation layer and the storage layer. Uh, so here you can see Alexio is in between uh, the, you know, the storage layer and the computation layer. And it's the system in between that can really, sh um, it tries to, it, it abstracts away the storage, so it provides a unified and single global namespace to applications. So applications can really only have to talk to one system, which is Alexio, and Alexio will help you manage and interact with data that you have in existing storage systems. So here, all the different uh, computation frameworks we have, like MapReduce, Spark, Presto, whatever we have, uh, they need to talk to. They only need to talk to Alexio uh, via the file system namespace, and the Alexio will help uh, interact and manage uh, with the data uh, to different uh, storage systems that exist. And so, applications don't need to change their code. It's really easy to add and remove new computation engines, add and remove new storage systems, and so Alexio really uh, enables that by being sort of this intermediate layer in between the computation and storage. And also, uh, Alexio is, 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 a, is a distributed system, so it actually can uh, help uh, store data closer to the computation. And so, um, in a lot of cases, Alexio can keep the data in memory close to applications, 
so that if you had to reread that data uh, many times, you can get a lot of benefits and, and reduce the IO uh, cost and thus increasing the IO performance. So now with Alexio in the picture, it can really enable a lot of, um, you know, in, enable a lot of new things, a lot of new ways of an analyzing the data. And it actually plays well in a lot of different scenarios, such as, you know, big data, there's IoT, there's machine learning, AI, and, and things like that. So uh, Alexio is applicable in many different areas. And also, it can, it's deployable in many different areas. It, it can be deployed in the cloud, uh, in, across different clouds, like, you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, it, it can also be uh, deployed on premise. So it, you can sort of mix and match any different type of environment for, um, for, for your data. In addition to that, um, Alexio is an open source project, and it's also one of the fastest growing open source projects. And so here we have, we've mapped sort of the first, uh, you know, four years of the open source project of, of Alexio. And Alexio has been open sourced about four years, four years old. And so here we can see the number of GitHub contributors um, to the project. And so Alexio is actually the top line. And if you look at GitHub today, I think there's over, there's over 600 contributors to Alexio. So it's been a really exciting to be a part of this growing community, as well as um, you know, just be able to see uh, how people are using Alexio in different ways. So next I'll go into sort of how um, and describe some, some of the use cases that some companies are using Alexio with. So first one I'll talk about is Barclays. Um, so they have, you know, they're running some machine learning types of uh, workloads. They're trying, trying to train some models. And so they're using Spark to do the training, but their data is backed, uh, is backed in Teradata. And so, uh, you know, what they had to do was every time they wanted to restart the, the, the machine learning training in Spark or to if, it, if something had, had, to, had to crash or something and, and they had to restart it, um, it, it would actually take a long time to read all that data back into Spark. And so um, it would actually take 30 minutes to an hour each time. So they could only do a few of these iterations uh, per day. And so, so they added Alexio to this, to, this, uh, to this system so that they really only need to get that data into Alexio once, at one time. They, they pay that one-time cost. And then from there, the Spark jobs could read directly from Alexio memory uh, repeatedly. And so that actually cut down the I.O. cost considerably. It went from hours to you know, just a few seconds to load that data in. And uh, this could, it really sped up their the development cost. It really sped up their, how they could train their models. Uh, next, I'll talk about uh, the use case at Baidu, which is uh, you know, the, the largest uh, search engine in, in China. Um, and so there, they were running analytic queries uh, uh, with Spark SQL on their data, which is in what they called Baidu file system. And so this, in this scenario, their Baidu file system was actually remote from their, their Spark cluster. Their Spark cluster was in a different cluster, a different data center than the Baidu file system. So Whenever they had to read the data, uh, it would actually have to go over the network, and it was actually a slow. So this was causing a lot of the, the, the slowness in their queries. So they added Alexio to their architecture, and they actually put Alexio on the side of the Spark cluster. So Alexio was, was deployed on the Spark cluster, and so whenever they had to read the data, they, it, it, Alexio would pull in the data for the queries and keep it in the Spark cluster side of the network so that whenever Spark needed to read that data again, it was much closer to them. It was potentially in memory as well. And so that could, uh, that really sped up a lot of their queries. And um, you know, some of the queries was up to like 30 times faster uh, with this architecture. Next, we'll talk about another uh, Chinese company, sort of like the travel, the, tr the travel site in China. Uh, theirs was interesting because they actually had many, they had multiple compute engines and they had multiple storage systems. They had you know, Spark and Flink to do both streaming and batch a computation, and they also had HDFS and Ceph to store their data. And this was actually causing um, a lot of issues in terms of performance and manageability, uh, since some of the data was remote, some of it was local, and they had you know, a lot of different applications and storage systems. So when they added Alexio, this actually simplified their architecture. All the applications only need to, needed to talk to Alexio and only needed to manage the Alexio namespace. 
And while, uh, in addition to that, Alexu could actually you know, keep some of that data uh, close to the computation and close to both Spark and Flink, and both of those computations could actually share that data uh, through memory. And that actually sped up a lot of their queries. And you know, in, in, in so, so some of their queries actually in, in the high peak times was actually 300 times faster because it didn't have to continually go over uh, the network to slower and remote data. And lastly, I'll talk about Garden Health. Uh, here they, um, they originally had, you know, a, a sort of a Spark cluster accessing data on HDFS, but it wasn't keeping up to the, to the scale that they needed. So they actually migrated their data to, to Minio, which is like a, a cloud you know, object store. But while doing that, that actually um, their performance began to suffer because it was actually always going to some object store, a remote object store, to get their data for their Spark cluster. So they added Alexio to their system, and they actually also used, used uh, Mesos for their, their um, you know, for their deployment. And by using Alexio in this new stack, they could actually keep a lot of the important data closer to the Spark clusters and closer to the Spark executors. And so while doing that, uh, they could speed up a lot of their, a lot, a lot of their I.O. and remove the I.O. as the bottleneck and, and sped up their queries. So that was sort of um, a few of the use cases that people have been using, how people have been using Alexio. And so now I'll talk a little bit about um, the overall high-level Alexio architecture. So here's a diagram of what um, the Alexio architecture looks like. Uh, Alexio mainly has three major components. One, uh, they have the Alexio client, Alexio master, and Alexio workers. And so here uh, we have, uh, on the diagram, we have the Alexio client all the way to the far left. And that's essentially uh, what the application will use to interact with, uh, with Alexio. And then it'll interact with the Alexio master and Alexio workers sort of in the middle of the diagram. And, uh, and lastly, uh, there is the, essentially the backend storage uh, system, such as like HDFS or S3 or other types of storage that exist. So uh, the sort of the middle, the middle layer, the Alexio masters and workers, they communicate uh, with the existing storage systems that you may have and the clients and applications interact with Alexio for the data and also for the metadata. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about each component. So Alexio client is the, is the main way that the applications um, interact with Alexio, both with the masters and workers. And there are actually several different types of uh, Alexio clients that exist. There's the, 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 the Java native Alexio client, which has all of the Alexio features. You can do um, specific operations like pinning and unpinning. You can do mounting, unmounting. You can set TTL, things like that. So these are Alexio-specific operations you can do with this Alexio client. There's also the HDFS-compatible uh, client, which um, it, it, it basically looks like HDFS to the application, but it's really talking to Alexio. And with this client, Applications do not need to change any of their code. They just need to change the, the path URI, and it'll just point to Alexio, and then they can move on from there, and it'll then communicate with Alexio instead of HDFS. And actually, there are other, other APIs out there, but S3 is actually a new one that was just released uh, maybe a few, a few weeks ago. Um, so you can actually have applications talking to Alexio through the S3 um, API. So the Alexio master is uh, another component, is another major component of Alexio. This, um, the master is, is mainly responsible for all the metadata in the system. And so there's, there's, there's different types of metadata, but mainly there's file system namespace metadata, and there's sort of block and worker uh, type of metadata. And the master is responsible for all of that. Uh, and the master is also fault tolerant, so it will essentially journal all the operations uh, that that occurs in the, in terms of the metadata and the secondary masters will tail that journal in order to 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 stay up to date with that with that information. And the Alexio worker is the third component of uh, of Alexio, and this is uh, they essentially manage and store all the the the, the data that that is involved in uh, that is involved in the in the files. 
And the worker can actually store the, the file data or block data um, in different storage media. And this is something that Alexio calls tiered storage. So with tiered storage, uh, Alexio can store data in hard drives, SSDs, uh, or memory. And there, there are some policies like eviction and promotion policies that exist in, in Alexio. And so this is how uh, we can keep, Alexio can keep uh, sort of the important data uh, closer to the application. And Alex, the Alexio worker is also the primary component that uh, communicates with uh, the storage systems. And so the Alexio worker will read and write data to the existing storage systems that you may have. So next I'll talk about how we use Alexio and Spark together um, uh, effectively. So one of the main, many things that Alexio provides, enables, is sharing data via memory. So if you were to have, for, for example, if you were to have uh, two Spark contexts and Spark executors running on the same machine, and they both wanted to store some of the data uh, for faster processing, you would actually have the situation where you'd have to duplicate some of that data in, in both of the executors. And so here we have two executors, uh, and they're both reading blocks one and block three, but they have to be bo uh, in, both, in both contexts. So with Alexio, Alexio can help share that data between the multiple contexts by keeping it sort of in, a, in the Alexio space, in Alexio memory, uh, but, but only one copy of it. And then each of the Spark contexts can actually just read it directly from Alexio memory instead of having to store it uh, internally themselves. And so this can actually uh, reduce some of the duplication that's possible. And also, you can share th that, that data across different, across different Spark contexts uh, through the memory. And something else that uh, Alexio can provide is uh, the, the in-memory data resilience across different contexts. So even if there's like a crash, or if there's, you have to restart the contexts, um, uh, Alexio can help, uh, help with that. And so here in this example, we have you know, a Spark context. Uh, it's, it's, it has stored some, some, some data. But if there's any reason that, uh, for, for whatever reason, if, if the context crashes or if it has to restart, uh, the storage actually will, will, will disappear. And so in order to help with that, Alexio, you can actually store the data in Alexio instead and not have it uh, in the context. And then so whenever uh, the, con the Spark context has to either, either crashes or restarts, um, the data can be reread from memory still because it's, it's, or it's in the Alexio space and not uh, in, the, in the, the, the executor JVM. So uh, this is another, another example of how Alexio can help uh, keep the data in memory and keep uh, the rereads of that data faster. And so you might be asking yourself, like, you know, how do I use Alexio with Spark? Well, it's actually very quite, it's actually quite simple since Alexio provides a file system namespace and file system API. Um, you essentially interact with Alexio like a file system. So accessing data is just like reading and writing files. So if you want to write data to Alexio, you can write to a file in Alexio. If you want to read from Alexio, you would read from the file from Alexio. And so what that looks like in sort of code examples is if you have uh, Spark RDDs, you can uh, read the RDD with uh, something like this, like save as, or you can write the RDD like save as text file or save as object file into a path in Alexio. And if you want to read that file, you, you just do something similar to, to, read, to read that text file or object file from an, an Alexio path. Also, for data frames, there are you know, similar, similar APIs for that as well. If you want to write uh, your data frame out, you would write it to say, um, you can write it as like a parquet file to an Alexio path, or you can read from a parquet file from an Alexio path into a data frame. And so it's very simple to, uh, to, you, to interact with Alexio with Spark, from Spark. So deploying Alexio is also, also pretty simple. Um, deploying Alexio, uh, you know, essentially, it looks like this. You, you just need to put Alexio in between Spark and uh, whatever storage system you might have, or it could be multiple storage systems. And uh, this is sort of the high-level idea. Uh, as long as this is sort of the deployment, uh, Alexio can provide uh, the benefits. 
Um, but if you're really looking for like the optimal I.O. performance that Alexio can provide, such as the in-memory I.O. that Alexio can provide, um, the, the recommended and ideal deployment scenario is actually to co-locate Alexio with, uh, with Spark and put it in the same machine. And if you can do that, if that's possible in your, in your environment, then Spark executors can actually read directly from memory, which uh, can you know, really increase the I.O. performance for that for that for that I/O and uh, as well as for that job. So, um, in the if it's possible, um, co-locating Spark and Alexio together is um, will 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 result in the highest uh, I/O performance. And lastly, I'll sort of talk about how Alexio um, and and Spark can be used together, and how and some experiments that we've done with it. So for these experiments, uh, we are using Spark. 2.2.0 and Alexio 1.60. And we are running on some Amazon instance R3 to X large. And we're uh, comparing how do we sort of read cache to data frame data. And so the, here are the results for that experiment. Uh, what we did was um, we, we, have ca we have a cached data frame, essentially. And so in Alexio, a cached data frame uh, looks like a Parquet file in Alexio. And a cache data frame in, in Spark is essentially the different ways you can cache, you can persist that data in Spark. So we, we try two different uh, memory, uh, memory storage, storage levels for Spark. We used memory only serialized and memory only. And so those are the dotted lines. And the Alexio is the, is the, blue, is the, is the blue line. And um, we, we, we used a different sized uh, uh, data frame, d different sized data frames, and, and we plotted like how long it took to essentially process that entire data frame. And so here uh, you can see uh, for lower, for smaller sized data frames and, and parquet files, uh, uh, the Alexio was, was a little bit slower than the, the Spark like, built in uh, persist memory only and also memory only serialized. And so uh, for the smaller sizes, you know, uh, Alexio has, has some overhead there. But as, at, at a certain point, after the size grows pretty large, um, Alexio actually outperforms some of the, the, the memory, memory cached, the Spark memory cached data frame. And uh, this just shows that Alexio um, can be a, a good way to cache the data uh, in the memory for the Spark executors, and 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 and, and, and sometimes can uh, outperform the, the internal Spark cache. And also, this is a this is another experiment that we did. This is uh, it's the same uh, data frame, but it's the 50 gigabyte data frame size, and we actually have the data frame in S3, so it's no longer uh, sort of local and cached in, in in Spark or in Alexio, but it's sort of uh, well, it's no longer cached uh, locally to the, to the machine, but it's actually far away in S3. So in this, in this scenario, this is when uh, a Spark context either crashes, has to restart, or like there's another context that needs to start up. Whenever there's a new context that needs to start up, it actually needs to read in that data again in order to do that computation. And so here is the time it takes to, to process that data. Uh, and as you can see, uh, if it's already cached in Alexio, in the Alexio memory, it's much faster to process that data uh, again with a new context because it's already cached to that machine. It's already cached in memory on that machine. So the I.O. performance is, is much higher. Whereas if you have to, re, if you, if you have to fetch that data again from, from uh, either S3 or, or local S3 or remote S3, it actually takes a lot longer. And so Alexio can actually provide you know, six to eight so in this example, it's like 68x uh, speed up uh, over fetching the data again. So, so in conclusion, uh, I, I introduced Alexio, what Alexio is. I, I, and you can see that it's pretty easy to interact with Alexio from Spark. And also, Alexio can provide a lot of I.O. benefits, uh, I.O. performance benefits uh, if deployed um, uh, with, uh, with Spark. And also, it, Alexio can enable um, interacting with a lot of different storage systems that you may have. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.
Any questions? Hi. So um, I didn't understand the, some part where uh, how Dual looks you interacts with the, your file system. So if you have a HDFS or S3 data and you won't use it from Spark to a looks, you, you need to warm up the data from the um, HDFF to a looks. How do you do it? Oh, so that uh, is done transparently. So if you just interact with Eluxio, uh, say you want to read some file, uh, on the f obviously if it's not in Eluxio yet, uh, it'll actually transparently pull that in for you, for the application, and the next time it'll already be there. So, so you it, just need to, you can mount some directories from your file system in Eluxio. Yes. You so need to do that, that, uh, that work to, to mount that, uh, the, those directories. Those yes, files. so you, you would, what you would do is you would mount some existing uh, bucket or directory into some path in Alexio, and then okay. from then on, you would the client would interact with that path, and it would pull in the data when necessary. Okay, uh, what's happen if uh, Luxio fails? The data I'm stored to memory, how does it uh, is flushed to this to to my storage? Well, there are different scenarios. Like if say say the data goes away from Alexio, um, the data is if, if the data is still in the storage, which it should be, then it'll just refetch it back in uh, when it's necessary. Okay, but I write to Aluxio, Aluxio files, and it didn't write it to, yes. to, to my file system. How yeah, do that's I a recover question. from that? So in, that, in the right scenario, um, there are actually different ways you can configure it. If you want to uh, write all the way through the storage system, then you, the, what would happen is the application would write data to Aluxio and the underlying storage system at the same time. Uh, that's one, one way you can do it. Another way you can do it is uh, do that asynchronously. So you would write to Alexio, but at some other point in time, it would sync it back to the storage system. Okay. Obviously, it's, you that, can configure it. The, the, the you can sync. configure it at, okay. at, at how, how you wish, okay. how the application wishes. Okay, thank you. That's it. So you mentioned uh, that Alexio caches the data, it caches the block so that Spark does not have to, right? How does Spark gets to know that Eluxio has cached the blocks and it does not have to cache it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, Sp so Spark will interact with Eluxio via the HDFS, HDFS uh, client, client, client library. So um, in, that, in that API, it actually will ask, Spark will ask the HDFS client, which is the Eluxio client, like, wh wh do these blocks exist uh, in the storage system? And Eluxio will, pr will provide the locations, like the the IPs and the locations of, that, of those blocks, so Spark will know where to schedule the tasks in order to get direct access to that data. So Spark will know, will essentially treat it like HDFS. Okay, and uh, the S3 under FS was already there in Eluxio's. I think it's there since Eluxio 1.3. You mentioned something about the S3 API. What exactly was that? Oh, that's the client-facing API. So if you have an application that's talking to S3, like directly to S3, through the S3 API, then uh, there, you can configure it to actually talk the S3 API to the Alexio, um, to Alexio directly, uh, to Alexio instead. So, um, so, if, so S3 has like, you know, you can like put, put a file, you can get a file and things like that. Uh, we, Alexio just added a new uh, REST-based uh, API so that S3, it looks like S3 to applications. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks. Uh, question? Uh, you mentioned about co-locating or, yeah, co-locating uh, Alexio with Spark nodes. So does, in that case, is my memory being shared by Alexio and Spark application both? Yes, it is. So, is, so when you when you co-locate between uh, when you co-locate Spark and Alexio together, um, obviously Alexio would need some memory. Uh, but there are actually a few different um, things you can do with that. First of all, if you were originally like caching a lot of data in Spark, then you no longer have to cache that data. So some of that storage um, space can be you know given to Alexio instead. But in, in addition to that, since Alexio does have the tiered storage option. Um, you can actually have Alexio store data uh, either in SSDs or hard drives. So um, it doesn't have to, you, Alexio doesn't have to store data in memory, but um, obviously if you want the highest performance, then you would want to store it in memory. Okay. And that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, Gene. Uh, the next talk will begin in 10 minutes.